Hello and welcome to my review of Harry Harrison's Technicolor Time Machine. So last week I reviewed another Harry Harrison book, Bill the Galactic Hero. Uh, I'll put a link in the description if you're interested, but the short story version is I liked Harry Harrison's style. The book had a sardonic knowing wit. Uh, the combination of that with your touch of zaniness or wordplay was reminiscent of Terry Pratchett. So that even though the story petered out after an inspired opening, I wanted to try something else by Harrison. So, with recommendations from Brian Aldiss and Leon Stover Fresh, fresh from the 1980s, this was the one I went with, the Colour Time Machine. It's a 1967 novel about a movie studio on the verge of bankruptcy that happens across a down on his heels scientist and his time machine. In order to have a new picture made by Monday and save the studio, they travel back in time to shoot a movie about the Viking sagas and the discovery of America. Naturally, things in the past don't go quite to plan, and after an injury to their star, they need to persuade the unpersuadable Vikings to step in and help out. The main problem, and the reason the novel fails for me, is that, much like Bill the Galactic Hero, I just don't get the joke. Whatever this is a satire of is not really clear to me. The main character, Barney, is a movie producer, and though he's occasionally referred to as cutthroat, his behaviour doesn't really match that description. He's just a bit heartless rather than actually unpleasant, so he functions poorly as hero or as villain. Likewise, the Hollywood satirised here seems to be the Hollywood of the 1960s that I'm not really familiar with, or it's just a very generic Hollywood that, because of its generosity, doesn't really match with something I know well enough to get the joke. Hollywood satires have been done before, not just by Elmore Leonard, but by the previously mentioned Terry Pratchett. So there isn't a reason for this not to work. It just doesn't because the characters are not very interesting. Nobody is exaggerated enough. Barney's description of Rough Hawk, the egotistic lead, has potential and shows flashes of the wit hinted at in Bill as well, such as on page 52 when Barney describes him as having bovine patience. However, after Ruff injures himself, he leaves, and, and Barney, despite fearing it means the end of the picture, he really doesn't do anything to stop him, and the book loses its character, which to that point had the most potential. However, it's fair to say that Ruff's depiction had already been bungled along with everybody else's. He's the egotist that doesn't love women, but can't be queer, because American librarians in 1967 wouldn't tolerate that sort of thing. Yet they do tolerate Slithy or Slithy, uh, his female co-star whose feminine charms are the subject of as much text as anything in what is a pretty slim volume. Studio chief L.M. Greenspan is neither crooked or wicked enough to entertain, and is largely absent from the story anyway. Barney is a one-note, slightly mean movie producer, but this is before Jeremy Piven was invented, so it's simply the batard that this book is hoisted by. Barney has no arc beyond wanting to make a movie, no character beyond being a bit of a git, and with a time machine on hand to fix all problems before they are problems, the story has no real point. If these figures are supposed to be representative of actual movie stars, then aside from Rough Hawk, who I assumed was supposed to be Rock Hudson, as mentioned, I just didn't get the references. Otter the Viking, who becomes the movie's lead, is a one-note cliché as well, functioning only when bribed with whiskey from the future. It does do what all science fiction trips to the past do, it rewrites history. Otter the Viking cliché who fills in for Ruff and discovers America only does so with the help of the film crew. Producer Barney Hendrickson is discovered to be the saga's Bjarni Jolfsson. Sorry about the pronunciation. As for the Pratchett wackiness that may have saved this from reading like a time-travelling movie producer's laundry list, those moments are AWOL as well. Instead we get, as early as page 6, Harrison explaining his jokes, a sure sign that the joke isn't funny. This is my life work, Hewitt said, waving his hand roughly in the direction of the toilet. What kind of life work is that? He means the machines and apparatus, he's just not pointing very well. On page 20, when discussing the details of this script, Barney insists you can't just rewrite history, and is told, what else have we ever done? This early exchange seems to set Barney up as the yes man, and L.M. Greenspan as the dictatorial, corner-cutting boss. However, the roles are then kind of reversed when Greenspan is reduced to feigning a heart attack to avoid his financiers and disappears from the novel, and Barney, we are told, is the evil producer type after all. It would be an awkward switch, even if the description was accurate. Maybe it's just that movie producers have been done better countless times since this was written, but the net result is this seems extremely tame and fails to generate or hold much interest. 
On page seven, we're told that building a real time machine into a movie budget actually saves money by being cheaper than a prop. It almost rings true. I'm sure everyone puts the prices up tenfold when they start to smell that movie money, but verisimilitude doesn't equal funny. I get the feeling that the novel is a bit high concept, that a movie producer took an interest in one of Harrison's novels, but then considered it too expensive to be viable, prompting Harrison to muse how it could be made cheaper. The time machine was an ingenious device, however it makes for very poor drama. In Back to the Future, they knew they had to break their time machine to have a story. It's a bit of a dull movie if Marty McFly goes back to 1955, takes a look around and then goes straight back. These things only work when time control is lost or misused. For example, Ruff, we are told, cannot love women or be gay because he loves himself so much. Well, unless we subscribe to the time cop rules that say you cannot be in the same time and place as yourself, with a time machine, Ruff could me and potentially date himself. If he steals the time machine, then we have the movie producers without control. We have the makings of some drama, personally between the two roughs, who undoubtedly wouldn't get on, and with the movie crew having to work in the Viking area without the all-fixing technology from the future. Interestingly enough, there is a moment in the book where drunk musicians break the time machine, but they are in the present at that point, so even though it takes them a while to fix it, they can still return to the past and the movie set at the moment they left. It's all nice and easy, and it's all quite dull. With a movie industry satire, you have to amp up the characters, make them larger than life. Even Ottar the Viking becomes just another dope once they figure out how to bribe him and coach him effectively. Slythe is a voluptuous figure in both senses of the word, but beyond lingering in the past when she shouldn't in order to stay with Otto and have a baby, it contributes nothing to the plot. It doesn't endanger the movie. It doesn't offer any other kind of drama. Love triangles are a bit of a cliche and unforgivable for some, but she could have gone into the story as Barney or Ruff's ex-wife or something, anything, to basically stir the overly congealed pot a little bit. Only at the end of the story, when two Barneys meet and one of them casually observes three Professor Hewitts in conversation, do we get a hint of the potential that time-travelling comedies can utilise, but it's too little and it's far too late, and doesn't extend beyond Barney playing an incredibly lame prank on his other self, at a point in the novel where it was clearly running out of room to properly develop the threat he hints at. It's a crushing waste which rather neatly sums up the novel. In conclusion, my expectations were fairly high from the praise this had received and my experience of Bill the Galactic Hero. However, the strengths of that novel are not represented here, but all its weaknesses are. Ultimately, without threat or comedy, this is simply a meandering story of various minor problems that crop up and then are resolved with time travel. As with Bill, I struggle to see who the audience for this would be. In modern times, this material has been handled far better with more aggressive satires and more fantastical stories being available in abundance. For better books about the industry, check out Moving Pictures by Pratchett or Get Shorty by Elmore Leonard. Or watch Entourage, or that episode of The Simpsons where they filmed Radioactive Man in Springfield, or even Crooked Features. For more imaginative time travel takes, check out episodes of Red Dwarf like Time Slides or Stasis Leak, or thanks for the memory, which isn't really about time travel, but does play with this timeline in a way that's fresh and interesting still 30 years later. Technicolor Time Machine desperately needs an injection of that kind of imagination. I can't think of a good reason to recommend this to anyone. So thank you for watching. Uh, there's other videos on the channel, not least my review of Bill the Galactic Hero, so feel free to check that out while you're here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Say up and at them. We have to fight our way out. Up and at them. Somebody hold me down, my legs are tingling. Up and at them. Up and at them.